Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and uh, this is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. There have been nearly 300 of them now, and if you'd like to check out the archives, go to batgap.com. Uh, there's also a donate button there, which I always mention at the beginning of interviews in case people don't make it to the end, because uh, this whole thing depends upon and relies upon the support of people who enjoy listening to it. Uh, my guest today is Enza Vita. Um, Enza is in Adelaide, Australia, where it is about almost midnight now. Um, and she heroically has uh, stayed up late and drunk more coffee than she's accustomed to drinking at this hour in order to participate in this conversation. Um, I met Enza about three, four years ago at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in, uh, at that time it was in San Rafael, California. She, she came to a uh, presentation that I was moderating, which you can find on BatGap. It was a panel discussion with, well, it doesn't matter, it's a panel discussion on, uh, and um, her, her, she was noticeable in the audience, very bright, and afterwards she came up and participated in a very deep conversation with one of the uh, participants in the panel, and so um, I met her husband, her partner, Leo uh, Drioli, who is a musician, and the two of them had flown all the way over, and I, I always had it in the back of my mind that I'd like to interview Enza, and finally we were doing it. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And it's good we waited because in the years since we met, you've written this book, um, Always Already Free, which I read in its entirety I, this week and really enjoyed. Yes. Actually, that book was ready five years ago. It's just it never got published until now. Uh, <laughs> but I hear you were something of a perfectionist in terms of, uh, you know, really making sure it was clear and, and you know, as... It was dub well. How the book started, basically, it was it wasn't meant to be a book. All mm. that that was was just my journals that I kept uh, as I was going through different experiences prior to realization and after realization, and um, and basically one day Leo said, "Can I see where you've been writing in those in those journals?" And I showed him some, and he, and, and he said, "You know, they're good. You should consider getting them published." Mm -hmm. And obviously they were not, they were just uh, jumbled up notes of everything. In the middle of it, there were quotes of Nigasagadatta, quotes of other teachers, and you know, and I also had. I have got the bad habit that when I hear something or somebody in a book or something, I write it down in my journal, right? And sometimes I don't even give it credit. So it was a little bit of a mess trying to my Jennifer, my really trusty uh, assistant. I go to her, she typed it all. She put it through different coffee, coffee Skype making sure. And she would say, Miss Enzo, we found another one. She meant that it's not yours. I said, oh, who is it this time? Miss Agadada, oh, I knew that I didn't write that or something. So anyway, it took a process like that of trying to get rid of all this stuff. And, um, but then it still was very thick. And some of the stuff wasn't really appropriate mm -hmm. anymore because I changed. And um, so I kept on revising and revising and revising it until it got to the present format Good. that it is now. <laughs> Well, I thought it was really clear, and you know, I so lately I've been, been in the habit of just reading people's books or listening to their talks and stuff, and not taking a lot of notes. I just kind of feel like I get to know them by reading their book or listening to their in other talks and interviews. So that's what I did. And as I read, I, there were you know, if you had been sitting in the room, we could have had conversations about just every page, just about every page in the book, you know, because there's all sorts of interesting points that come up, some of which concur with my experience and understanding, and some of which differed a little bit. And I thought, well, I'd like to question her about that. But I think all this will come out during the course of this conversation. <clears throat> so you're from Sicily originally, which is in an island off the southern coast of Italy, and it's part of Italy. It's where the mafia is from. The Pope yes, says, you Pope want me says, to start with that? You yeah, might as well start, and you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the, po the Pope said the, the mafia can't be considered good Catholics anymore, so. <laughs> yeah, we do have mafia. And actually, I wasn't going to talk about this, but some relatives in my family were involved. Yeah. We never did because my dad didn't really belong to, you know, he's usually passed on to the male mm. lineage. So my dad married my mom and he wanted to have nothing to do with it. But actually, I remember 
my grandmother being visited by some guys when I was a, a kid, and he seemed a very nice guy. I found out after that he was wasn't that nice. <laughs> <laughs> huh. And so you grew up in Sicily, and um, you know, there's a pattern that I've recognized among many people that I've interviewed and other spiritual people that I know about, which is that very often they they have stuff going on when they're little kids. You know, they it's they don't necessarily have a normal childhood. They have no. unusual experiences. Um, and, you know, I, my explanation for that would be that, you know, we all come into this life at varying degrees of, evol of spiritual evolution, some very highly evolved, some maybe close to realization, some very far from it, probably due to development in past lives. And uh, mm. that, therefore, some kids are just inclined to, to sort of be different from from their peers and to have interesting spiritual experiences at a very young age. Yeah. Mm. Well, I definitely was different and my family didn't really understand what was going on. And I think we, we talked about it with uh, Jerry as well. Actually, when I was probably five or six years old, uh, they took me to a psychologist because there was a a sister of my dad that had some sort of a mental illness. So they obviously were very afraid that that's what was going on with me. Because yeah. I would be talking about lights, I would be talking about out of body experiences. I didn't use those words, I didn't know what they were. I would be talking about lucid dreaming where I would be awake in, in the dream state. And so they thought there's something wrong with this child. And uh, um, it was, as a kid, it was actually traumatic for me to see how worried my parents were. And I decided that I wasn't going to talk about my experiences after that time, you know, so my mom crying, uh, worried that there was something wrong with me and sort of a, a zipped it from then on because mm. I thought that I, I couldn't really. But I had all sorts of experiences like that. And at first I thought everybody was having them. But when I talked to my sisters or my friends, um, that wasn't that wasn't happening. And so, yeah, and I also had um, some what you call memories of past life. Yeah. I didn't know back then what they were, but amongst with red robes that I'd never seen before. See, I grew up in a, this little village. There was only like 1,500 people. And um, we didn't even have a library. I used to catch the bus to go to school. So there was absolutely nothing. There was a church and there was the local priest. And that was the closest that I could get to spirituality. And I would love to, uh, I love to sort of sneak back into the church even when nobody was there. And we had this really old priest um, and he wasn't very friendly. He was like, what are you doing here? Go home. Um, <laughs> and after he left, after he left, a young priest, probably in his 20s, came and he was a lot more friendly. And so he became, you know, I my first teacher where I'll, I'll be going there and sort of asking him questions and and he was very nice, you know, he, he would just try to answer however he could. But eventually, even he had to say, OK, just one question. <laughs> so <laughs> I had to think really carefully which question I wanted to ask. So you were full good, of questions. You know? I was full of questions because I was having all these experiences and nobody seemed to know what, what they were. What you know? sort of experiences and, were you having? Well, apart the experiences of like every night I would go over the roof of the houses mm -hmm. in this sort of a uh, transparent ball. Mm -hmm. And I would also sneak out at night on top of the roof and uh, I would sit there and I would just look at the stars and I would just feel so amazing. Um, and I would fall asleep there sometime and wake up in the morning and um, uh, I would have lucid dreaming where I would be awake in the dream. So there wasn't much difference between my normal everyday life and the dream state. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be fully awake and... Uh, um, and this yeah, was like pretty young, sort of five, stuff. six years old? Very young. And also, also, you know, I was a pretty strange child. You know, when I was born, the... Um, the, the nerve of this eye got damaged. And so by the age of one years old, the eye was blind. Oh. And yes, and 
uh, it's still blind, so I can see a little bit. Um, but back then, um, the eye also become cross-eyed, mm -hmm. right? And in Sicily, there is this, um, because you couldn't see, uh, in Sicily, there is this thing that people that have this sort of condition, they actually have psychic powers, right? Oh. <laughs> so there was this, together with what they heard about experiences I was having, because I was talking, you know, when I was little, I didn't know that I had to shut up, right? Yeah. So I was like the little witch of the village, you know? Mm. And... Um, yeah, so... It's a good a thing it wasn't a few hundred child. years earlier. No, well, and, and that's the thing. When, if you're a girl and, um, and you have, I guess, the, a facial disfigurement, it, back then it wasn't as socially accepted mm. as well. And, um, you know, but I guess in, in retrospect, you know, and the way the kids teasing me and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but in, in retrospect, I realized that um, it made me closer to people that, we're different, mm. you know, they were imperfect, you know, mm. uh, because I considered myself imperfect um, because of this, this, uh, this problem. And, uh, and I realized that everybody felt imperfect in some way or another, and, and that this one was just a, an hysteria thing. They just showed um, how everybody felt yeah. that there was something wrong with them. <laughs> yeah, so it mm. was a great gift and a great teacher. It's interesting the whole thing about, you know, insanity and spirituality and, you know, how sometimes they're mistaken for one another. Um, and, you know, some people might have thought you were crazy. And I know in, in, in my own life, my mother actually did go insane and spend years in mental hospitals, but she was also a very spiritual person. And, and this all started out with like, you know, messing around with a Ouija board and, and then she thought she was talking to her mother and then she started seeing auras around things. She started seeing auras around trees mm. and everything mm. and yet she was, you know, really flipping out. Um, so did you ever have uh, times when you, you know, not only maybe your friends but you thought that maybe you were kind of going crazy because, you know, you were in such a different state then? Um. Not when I was young, mm -hmm. um, later in life, just prior to my realization, there was a period in my life where um, uh, things were going on with my mind that I felt that, ooh, what's going on is scary, you know? Yeah. I would tell my, one of my teachers, I feel like I'm going nuts because I'll be at night and I would watch my mind spinning by itself and I was just watching it and I couldn't do anything about it. Was that when you were asleep or awake? Awake, fully uh -huh. awake. I would uh -huh. just see the mind machine just going faster and faster and faster and faster and as if I was almost locked out. Hmm. So I was having all these strange experiences leading up to um, the realization. Yeah, well we might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves but you know seems to me, from what I've observed over the years, and probably you have too, that uh, realization necessitates a, a, and actually can be defined as a huge transformation. And um, when you go from point A to point B, you know, going from ordinary state to a, a realized state, all kinds of stuff has to get rearranged in your psychology, your physiology and all. And, and sometimes that can be quite tumultuous, you know. It is, and it still is. I'm still going through some stuff mm -hmm. of that, some reminds of that, because as that realization comes in into the body, because people think that um, the realization of our transcendental state is it, right. it's finished, <laughs> right? So you go up the mountain and you have all these amazing experiences. You can have amazing, some, some people don't, you know, your, your mind stops, your thoughts stop, you, you're blissed out all the time and all this stuff. So it's very easy for us to think that uh, we've reached the ultimate state, but it's not the end. In a way, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Yeah. yeah. It's just the beginning. In the first few years after my realization, after the first stage, I guess, the realization of my transcendental nature, all I wanted to do is actually sit in my backyard mm -hmm. and just immerse myself in this amazing Yes, love, um, 
And I think that's what people do, you know, and they think this is it, this is the end. But it's all, almost like you're allowed to stay there a little while and then, you know, something within yourself, if we're talking like that, if we're talking duality, you know, like in, du in dual um, terms, then we say the divine, so is that time to get back, yeah. time to go, time to descend back from the mountain into the worlds of time and space. Mm. And reminded of the Zen ox herding pictures, you've probably seen those, you know, the different stages. And there's the transcendental stage where there's nothing to be seen anymore, it's just a blank canvas. But then eventually the guy comes back into the marketplace, you know, riding the ox, big smile on his face. <laughs> yes, yes. And, um, and the descent is very important because, you know, at first you resist because you're not, you don't want to leave the space of absolute beauty. And also one of the characteristics is that the soul, if you want to talk the soul, wants to go deeper into it, go, go deeper into the absolute. And um, um, I but, lost my but in a way you're <laughs> I not, lost what I was saying. But in a way you're not leaving it, right? You're bringing it with you back into the world. You descend, and as you descend, you don't descend as a god, you descend as a human being and you take on, again, the garments of human limitations. So you start feeling the fears, you start feeling the thoughts, you start feeling the emotions. But now you know that all thoughts and all emotions are not arising in that separate person here called Enza, but they're arising in that one being in which everything is sharing with. with. Mm. And, uh, and so when, when we realize that, I guess our life takes on a deep value and sacredness because we realize that the divine is experiencing itself as everything, um, as the world, in and as the world, in and as all others, and in and as us. And, um, and I guess when that happened, with the, with the descent, and also with the conscious suffering, um, because up until now we we have suffered, but the, the suffering was mostly unconscious. And when we take on, uh, uh, when we choose to come back as and be a, a conscious participant to that divine play, um, then something else starts happening where. Um, uh, I guess a, a love and compassion that comes from, um, it doesn't come from the body-mind unit, but it comes from that source, starts coming in. And when this love and compassion um, marries with the power of transcendence, it becomes like the divine impulse that um, is the will and the wish to help other people into the realization of their highest potential, which is enlightenment. Mm. So, you know, the transcendental state is just the first, the first bit. Uh, there has to be that maturity then, that then the sees the divine um, in everything, you know, and I guess this is then what we call true bhakti. The true bhakti is the love that sees the beloved everywhere. Um, and this is when it starts really maturing because we, then we are conscious participant of life or all of life. We are the transcendental, but we also are everything here and there's no separation. Oh, there's a lot of great stuff in what you just said. Um, I was reminded of a Rumi quote where, um, you know, Rumi says, uh, God sleeps in the rock, dreams in the plant, stirs in the animal and awakens in the human being. And That's right. It's um, and the implication is that God is imminent. It's God is all pervading in, in creation in in all those things. But these different mediums—rock, plant, animal, human—are uh, have different different capacities to reflect or express the divine. You know, um, and somehow I was reminded of that as you were speaking, and and. And it's funny because before we started, I was remembering a conversation that um, you were having with Mark McCooey at the Science and Non-Duality Conference when you were uh, after our little uh, presentation we gave. And I overheard you guys talking about 
um, God consciousness as opposed to uh, self-realization. At least that, that's what I thought you were talking about. And your friend Leanne from Adelaide sent in the question, do you believe the term <clears throat> self-realization <coughs> and God-realization are the same states? If not, how do you see the difference? And I think you've kind of just laid it out because you were saying that yeah. there was a transcendental phase which was like self-realization, uh, yes. but then it seems to have matured into a much more um, devotional, divine-oriented, service-oriented, you know, divine in, in the world uh, kind of orientation. Mm. So you want to elaborate on, the, on those points? Well, we, we seem, seem to think that, excuse me. Uh -huh. Need a little energy oh. to say this. Oh. <laughs> um, we seem to think that um, realization is somehow uh, bringing the story of the me, mm -hmm. of the separate self that we believe to be, to a satisfactory conclusion. Mm. But actually what happens is that it is realized that the me that we believe as us to be, the separate person, is not an aware being. And not a what? The, it's not an aware being. An aware being. being. I see. Yes. The only aware being is the one being in which everyone shares in, everything mm -hmm. shares in. So, um, so that's the only aware being. This aware being expresses itself through everything. Mm -hmm. World, stars, you and me, everything. And um, so, you know, when people say there is no one here, um, I guess that's true in one sense. There is no separate person here. But the divine is, 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 is um, experiencing itself through each one of us mm -hmm. at every moment. And, and that's, I guess, that's the um, God realization. There is only one being. And, um, and uh, when people talk about non-duality, they think that that means um, just one, one, one thing. But uh, the non-duality is we are that one being, but we also, uh, we are everything else. Yeah. As well. um, Both. Both apply. It's, it's, I don't mind the way you're sitting. It's kind of pretty, but uh, you don't need to lean in really close if you don't want to. Uh, you can just sit back and relax. <laughs> no, I get excited. Oh, then that's okay. <laughs> that's why I do that. <laughs> In a minute, I'll be standing up. Okay, good. <laughs> then we'll just see your, your belly. <laughs> um, there's a line that, from the Incredible String Band that I, I, you just reminded me of, which was, light that is one, though the lamps be many. Um, so it wouldn't be true to say there are no lamps, uh, it's, but rather it's the same light shining through all lamps. And, but that doesn't mean there are no lamps. So, I mean, could, could you, would you agree that, you know, it's not true to say there are no people, uh, your children are, are an illusion or something. It's like, okay, you are a person, but you're just not only a person. You know, there's a much vaster reality to what you essentially are. But that sort yeah. of shines through the person. Absolutely. There is, there is a huge difference between saying that there is no one here and in a way that it's a narcissistic and insensitivity to the pain of others and also to the beauty of the world and to actually realize that directly and in a way that opens their heart and dissolves the apparent separation between transcendental and ordinary reality. That's nice. <clears throat> yeah, because I mean, there are teachers running around or have been saying that sort of thing. And, uh, and if someone comes to them with a heart-rending story, like my child got hit by a car, you know, they, yeah. ac they actually might respond by saying, there is no child. There's no one there. There is no there. car. There is, there. No, there is, is no one. Right. This is just wrong. a story. You know, nothing happened. That's and, uh, whew, you know, I mean, maybe on some ultimate level that's true, but it's not the whole picture. No, definitely not. Uh, realization doesn't mean that we are disconnected from our feelings. Right. doesn't mean that we don't have any or disconnected from the world. It's not as if we are sitting in this space where there is nothing, um, we don't have to care about anything. You know, who wants to become that? Who wants to become that kind of an idiot? <laughs> and so um, the point is that, of course, there is 
there is people and all this is happening and it's all one being ultimately it's all one being experiencing itself through everything yeah I don't know do you want to say more? no it's okay i can i can or you can keep going um mm -hmm. i mean how could it be anything other than one being because if we analyze anything you know what is this it's it's paper, but then what is paper? You, okay, it's molecules. What are they? They're atoms. What are atoms? They're subatomic particles. What are they? Well, you get down to something that's not even physical, and uh, you know that that's some right. some scientists are actually you know, they call it the vacuum state, and some scientists, John Hagelin, who was in that presentation I referred to, <clears throat> equates with consciousness and makes a really good argument of how the the, the essential nature of what appears to be physical is consciousness and that that is obviously your essential nature but you know having gone through all that that is not to say there is no book you know and that we couldn't read this book and you know get something from it so there's kind of a, yeah. a both and appreciation yeah. of of, a cre of, cre of yeah. the universe and there are there are obviously paths and teachers that say that there is nothing that we as the separate person can do to um awaken mm -hmm. And this, of course, is absolutely true. But if there is still a person there, if we're still identified with the apparent person, then to say that there is nothing or there is nothing to do or that we're already enlightened, it's like deluding ourselves and um, just putting a, a veneer of lofty thoughts over, over our suffering, our suffering of separation. And, um, and now, usually, I find that these people are even in a worse position than they were before they started seeking, because now they sort of with the denial of their, of their suffering, um, they just live in a world where this connection is interpreted as being peace. Mm. And um, but sooner or later, God is always very merciful. Sooner or later, uh, our, our suffering will resurface in full measure and we will be forced to confront what we thought that we left behind. So it's just a stage. Yeah, it's a stage that some people stay in for a long time, but it's a stage. Yeah. And actually, in the big picture of things, how, 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 how vast the span of time really is, I guess it's not a long time. No. <laughs> just a blink of an eye. No. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I run into these people and, and you know, who say there's nothing to do and and usually what they, I don't know, it becomes sort of an excuse to not do anything, really, if you think there's nothing to do. And then, but then, well, you got to do something, so I might as well get on the internet and start telling other people there's nothing to do. Yes, <laughs> yeah. There are, I always see, they, they even come sometime on my Facebook, um, and there are little wars on Facebook or social media about the two camps. Yeah. There's nothing to do, and you have to do something. And, um, you know, even this is a stage, because I guess when you see that everything is that, then you lose the interest in, in telling people um, that, for example, they are doing bowing, uh, bowing and um, bowing, is that the yeah, right? Yeah, bowing, like you bow bowing. to a, a You know, yeah, the Zen, the Zen, you know, and mm -hmm. they do a lot of mantras, mm -hmm. you know, and um, uh, these people say, oh, well, that's a, a, a dual practice, you know, but, but it's like you, you don't care about telling them um, that these practices are not necessary. And at the same time, you don't go around telling the real radical non-dualist, you know, that they say that there is no practice. You, you don't care about telling them that practice can be as natural as breathing. So yeah. um, everyone is trying to find their path there and every uh, path there is valid uh, for that particular individual. Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes I say, well, you know, people say, well, you shouldn't do any practice because it reinforces the notion of a practicer. <laughs> and I, I, I respond, well, then you shouldn't eat because it reinforces the notion of an eater. <laughs> That's right. The, there are the two provenance stories are you have to meditate to get enlightened or you don't have to meditate. Um, those are the, those are the, and some, some, in some places they tell us, um, oh, you just need to drop the search, drop the, because you're already that, you know, like some type of enlightenment by declaration, I guess. Uh, and maybe it works for some, but I guess me, for me, it didn't work. I, I just traveled the, 
the road of yeah. suffering and seeking and studying and uh, and then one day come to an end and and then you drop so, the search it dropped and it, then I dropped it the dropped itself that's right yeah and i guess ultimately you know our awareness our awareness our true nature accepts everything yeah and um and um if um somebody says that um practice is needed usually awareness will say yeah okay and um if somebody says the practice is not needed awareness is able to embrace paradox and will say it's okay. not needed sure. you know and only the mind can't do that see and and I, and i guess this is the point if we are in a state where something is has been excluded whether it's the ordinary world or something else this is a good sign that we probably in a still in a dualistic state mm. even though we might think that we reached the ultimate hmm. yes um i meant to there was this ramana maharshi quote that somebody sent me and i meant to look it up before this interview and i forgot but um basically well first of all he was fond of using the old saying it takes a thorn to remove a thorn you know um and that you know even though ultimately practices might not make sense or be necessary they have a, a function at a certain stage uh, but also the quote i was referring to was something where he said it's a very rare individual who is just on the brink of realization and doesn't need to do anything and they're just going to fall into it uh, or you know with just yeah. some slight um, guidance or something but for the vast majority um, I'm, i'm roughly paraphrasing but this is what he said for the vast majority there are all sorts of things that one might benefit from um, and you know make progress through and there goes the word progress which we can talk about but uh you know he's held up as the sort of gold standard of of spiritual mm. teachers these days and mm. you know, that's basically what he said yeah i mean ramana maharshi basically he would he would give at first you would give the um, i never met him but i've studied some of his stuff and um he would give to people the ultimate truth there is nothing to do right. but not everyone could uh understand immediately that and Small then minority. if yeah if that wouldn't happen then you would give him other things mm -hmm. mantras meditations and i actually heard a story i'm not sure how true it is somebody told me that he he told one of his um people that were around he was being really hard on them um you know where everybody was allowed to sit around him and he was a very sweet man ramana mahashi this this particular disciple he would always send him to do work and all this sort of stuff uh, you know like work for for everyone else and never had the chance to meditate and even the some of the other people they started thinking why are you being a little bit so harsh you know on him and yet after many years of this guy doing service and never even seeing to meditate hmm. once he finally was allowed in and he sat down to meditate he was right and bang it yeah. happened yeah yeah so yeah so he needed he needed that service to others to remove the obstacles and then so everybody finds their own way there i guess you know it's Who a good point judge <laughs> yes yeah, uh, shankara talks about the fact that um not everyone is ready for uh gyan yoga or the the sort of the highest non-dual teaching that um various types of service and meditation and practices karma yoga yeah. different things uh yeah. can purify one to the point where the the highest teaching becomes you know, appropriate um and again you know people Absolutely. people might hear this and say yeah but you know there's there's nothing to do i mean why should we go through all these stages purification and all that stuff it's all one it's all nothing is real yada yada yada, yada. but yeah. you remember that uh that that thing at the science nando ali conference that you attended the one of the main points was this based on this tibetan saying that um don't mistake understanding for realization yes you know yes and then the second part yes. was don't mistake realization for liberation but i i guess we're yes. dwelling on this because it is sort of a little bit popular or common to to do this to sort of read a lot of books get good with the words and then somehow convince yourself that that's what that you're actually living what all these words are referring yeah. to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um. Mm. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> what was the question? Well, just maybe, maybe we've covered this point, but we're just, we're just talking about the importance of actual experiential realization as opposed to 
some kind of intellectual understanding that can become yes. quite hypnotic. I mean, if, if, you do, yes. if you read enough books, you can really get this stuff drilled into your head. Yes. But it's you not the same. The right... as, yeah. No, it's not the same. Um, when you, um, if, if this is only intellectually, intellectually understood, it's not going to remove the, the separations. It's going to be just a temporary measure and eventually that separation is going to surface again. Yeah. So let's, let's backtrack a bit. So what sort of, I, I, in, I listened to your interview with Jerry Katz and uh, you said a lot of interesting things, but one is that we haven't told people yet. Um, you left home at the age of 17 to, to go to Australia and mm. and because you had an aunt in Alice Springs and you decided yes. to go there you didn't speak a word of English uh, and your parents didn't want you to go you were too young and everything but you, you insisted and and so finally you went um, that so confirmed in my village that I was crazy. that you were crazy right? <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah and then you just got odd jobs and washing dishes and this and that and, and tell the story a little bit about how, how you eventually kind of like found a spiritual book and you kind of learned English by studying a spiritual book and looking up the yes, words in a dictionary. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, when I was little, one of the, one of the things uh, that I used to do, I used to have two symbols and I didn't know what they were, but I, if you go to my house, they're, they're carved in every wall, on the roof, everywhere. And um, there were two symbols there and I kept on drawing them and I kept on saying to my parents and my friends, I have to remember these two symbols. They're very important. And my mom tells me that I used to, since I started drawing, I started making these things. And I didn't actually know what they were. Um, and when I got to Alice Spring at 17, I was walking down Toll Street, which was the only road, didn't even have asphalt. It was just a dirt road with just a tiny little shop. And I was walking down with my cousin and sort of a, I looked on the shop window and there was a book and on the on the cover of the book, there was uh, one of the symbols that I'd been drawn since, uh, drawn since I was a, a little child. And when he and I bought the book. It was like and, a mandala uh, or a lotus or something? It, it was a lotus flower. Mm. There were two symbols. The, the, what I know now to be, one was the, uh, the um, lotus flower, the thousand petal lotus. Mm -hmm kept on going on on and on forever. I would I would draw it and sort of I'd go off the page. Mm. And the other one was a geometric shape, which mm. I used to call the diamond. Mm. And uh, I've got an idea now that, what that is. Um, but, you know, I know uh, that I brought him back from past lives mm -hmm. where um, I had been um, in Tibet and uh, India. Um, yeah, different past lives that I lived in, in there. I know that this sounds crazy <laughs> to yeah. some people that don't, you know, some people think, oh, past lives, you know. But well, to this audience, I think it doesn't audience. sound crazy. No. You know, people are used to the idea. Um, yeah. Although, you know, since we've been talking about the, the kind of the radical non-dualist, some of them say, no, there couldn't be past lives because there's no person. And so if you're going to have multiple lives, who is this person that's having them? That yes. That's not possible. But... Um, it, that sort of denies the whole notion that there are relative realities, at least apparent relative realities, and that there are subtle relative realities as well as gross. And that if the physical body yeah. dies, there's still a subtle yes. body which doesn't die yes. and can go into another physical body. So it seems That's pretty right. logical to me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and so you remember some of those past. So you must have like yes. been doing spiritual practices and living spiritual lives and all that in, uh, in past yes. lives. Yes, I remember some really hard lives that I lived, you know, one in particular. Austere. Um, very austere, yeah. Mm. One, I was like this uh, sadhu living in a mountain and uh, just eating grass. I was so skinny. <laughs> I couldn't even tell that whether I was man or woman, you know. Wow. It was so, and um, another one, another one that really uh, sort of affected me this life was um, I was, um, uh, a wandering monk mm -hmm. in, in a group, you know, that we'd never stayed anywhere and um, we had nothing and we just begged and um, went around just like that and uh, praying and devoted to God. And um, and I was a, a young man and um, I did everything. I was so devoted. I, I, so, I loved God so much. Mm. And um, 
but then uh, when uh, it was time for me to die, I was lying down, I remember lying down on the, on the ground and some of the other monks were near me. And the last few words were like, I said to the old monk, um, I've done everything for God, everything. I sacrificed everything and he has never visited me. Mm. And I was heartbroken. I, I died heartbroken because I've done, I'd done everything for his love and I never got it. Mm. And uh, I think that had an effect in this, in this life, yeah. you know, that surfaced in my teenage years where there was a bit of rebellion against God, you know. Mm. Well, you're getting mm. it now, though. <laughs> and it's interesting because on God's time, you know, a, hum, uh, a human lifetime is the snap of a finger. And yeah. so, you know, here you are dying. Oh, I've never gotten God's love. And God is, pati yeah, God is patiently yes. just overseeing yes. the universe. And, and in the snap of a finger, he, here you are, you know, realizing God. And on another level. In a fresh and body. Yeah. And in, in, uh, in uh, on another level, time and space, it's all happening at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I'm dying in this moment, in this place. Right. <laughs> complaining yeah. that God is not here. Yeah. Speaking of sadhus, uh, this friend of mine who lives in, in, in the Himalayas sent me a nice little story. He said that there's a beautiful sadhu in Gangotri. Gangotri is way up in the Himalayas near the source of the Ganges, who loves your Buddha at the gas pump stuff. He lives in Gangotri year-round, much of the time with no electricity. His kutya, which is a little hut, buried in snow. But somehow he finds your site and he loves it. <laughs> so, yeah. so hello to that guy if he's watching. <laughs> Fantastic. It's cool. Um, so, um, when you had these memories of past lives, was it like you're walking down the street and all of a sudden you had a memory, or were you meditating, or how did these memories come to you? Both. Sometimes they would come in um, dreams, lucid dreaming. Um, I was I was having that mm -hmm. um, since I was a, um, a little kid. Yeah. Sometimes they were like lucid dreaming, and uh, sometimes was like um, just like memories, like remembering something you know like when you remember something from childhood yeah. and it just comes and it's oh you know yeah. and you see the whole thing you can go in there and, and it's like real you know there is no difference um and some 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 of them came through meditation yeah. meditation retreats and stuff yeah okay so you were walking down the street in alice springs and you saw this book and it had a lotus on it and you bought the book and started figuring out how to read english and uh so yeah. how, how did things progress from there? Well, um, after that, um, I was on it. I, I, and then I moved to Adelaide. And um, basically, over the years, I uh, flirted and fallen in love with lots of spiritual tradition. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that people tell you that you're meant to stick to one thing. But that wasn't my case. What happened is that it seemed like the right teacher and the right teaching would up here and all that I needed to do is stay open and just work as hard and as sincerely as I could mm -hmm. and um, and they succeeded so from uh, and they were very varied you know from um, um, Nada Yoga to Dzogchen to Sufism to uh, Tibetan altars and uh, shamanic um, things uh, Aboriginal spirituality uh, one of my cousins is married to a full blood Aboriginal, and somehow I got a little bit of, of a taste of that. Um, so, and it was great. It, it was actually, you know, I was blessed to be able to do that because it gave me the opportunity to see that one truth that sits at the core of every path. Yeah. And um, and it taught me not to cling to one way of one idea of it. You know, and, and in some of my past lives, I remember that I've done that, where I stuck to one idea, mm -hmm. one, you know, I grabbed one concept and stuck to it, and I vowed never to do that again. And um, and I guess, you know, that has been the, the gift of uh, being able to see this truth in so many different traditions. Yeah. Um, who is that saint? Not Ramana Maharshi, the guy pr pr earlier on in the 1800s, uh, I forget his name, he was a famous saint and, and Kali devotee, but he, he went through and sort of went through the path of a great many different traditions and sort of found, you know, 
went from A to, A to Z in each tradition and found that they all led to the same goal. Um, it's the many faces, yeah. the many faces of God. You know that saying that you, you should dig one deep hole rather than a dozen shallow holes. Um, yes. But uh, here's another way of looking at it. Take a dozen tools to dig one hole, you know? <laughs> so that's, yes. that's kind of what you did. Yeah. I, 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 it's almost like I didn't do it. It's, I didn't go out of my way. It's like the teachers would just appear. Some of the teachers, I tell you, I tell you one, just one. Mm -hmm. um, we already, you know, myself and Leo, apart being in different paths, you know, with our job, we got to interview different spiritual teachers that came. Uh, and also we did our own practices. Yeah, you publish a magazine practices. or something, don't you? Yes, we've been publishing different magazines since 1998, mm -hmm. spiritual magazines. And, um, but for example, one particular teacher was a, a, a dervish, a Sufi mystic mm -hmm. from Iran. And we met him at a, a Vipassana retreat. Uh, after Vipassana retreat, he was there. He was just wandering around the world like they do. They're like similar to the wandering monks of India, and um, and we started talking about um, his love for Rumi. And Leo had this dream that he wanted to get um, a poem of Rumi in the Farsi language and translate it. And obviously, we don't know Farsi. And um, and suddenly talking to this guy, we didn't know he was a dervish or anything like that, a Sufi mystic. And um, somehow there was this thing, yes, I love Rumi and I can speak Farsi, right? When can I move in? That's what he said to us. Mm. When, and he did move in. He, he lived in a house for probably six to eight months. <laughs> and uh, it was amazing. And, you know, being waken up at three o'clock in the morning because he to Sorry. teach us different practices mm. um, and some of the practices, even though we, we were familiar with some of the Sufi practices from the Azra Inya Khan side, yeah. um, we didn't know about some of these uh, this particular practices that he was showing us. You know, one was the obvious, you know, the twirling, um, uh, but there were some other things like um, some other practices, they were quite secret and somehow he was passing them on. And he was a strange man in the sense, the dervish is meant to be always very humble and never show how advanced they are. Mm -hmm. That's the old thing. Yeah. And so you always never show, he was always like, oh, this is just the grace of my master, my teacher, my guru. But then when he, he spoke to his guru on the phone, his face became luminous. Hmm. And sometime when he was in the backyard and he thought that nobody was watching and I would see his face was luminous and his eyes was full of love. And um, and as soon as he, saw, he would see me, he would just, hmm, oh, I was just uh, watching the tree. And it was like that. It was lovely. Cool. And then he, he went back to Iran and, and he told us amazing stories of what really goes on. And when he was training, having to cross, um, having to walk, four or five hours every day to get to his teacher mm. and cross a river, you know, and he had to tag off his clothes and put them over his head uh, and cross the river. And if he got the light, the door of the temple were closed and he, he had just done all that for nothing, wow. you know? And um, yeah, and it, it was his wife saying, oh, these pe people in the West, you know, they think they're suffering, doing meditation and stuff, you know, you have to really work hard in those places. Yeah. Well, that kind of points that points to an interesting principle or interesting point, which is that um, the sincerity and the ardency of one's search often correlates with the, the fullness of the results. At least I've seen, you know, people who are sort of yes. lackadaisical about it eh, and yeah, whatever, yes. you know, maybe I'll meditate yes. someday or something or read yes. a book. They don't get much. But the people who are just on fire usually end yeah. up having very much more profound realizations. Yeah. You know, people people tend to worry about the teacher more. You know, is this a good teacher? Has she got the right career? Uh, Have they got the right lineage? But it's really nothing to do with the teacher. It's to do with the student, how earnest they are. Yeah. You know? And, you know, it's, it's almost the teacher is there, um, you know, to help, you know, and me personally, my, my way of teaching is that I try to tune in to the person and try to help them um, for them to discover what they need. Because I feel that um, 
sometimes if a teacher tells someone what to do, it just doesn't work. Uh, that's an interesting point about the, it's not so much the teacher as it is the, the, the student. I mean, I think mm. both, both are important, but it's, there was, mm. there's a story from the Mahabharata where um, Arjuna, the great warrior, uh, had this great archery teacher, and his archery teacher was supposed to be the best, and, and he, he made the teacher promise him that um, he would make him, Arjuna, the best archer in the world. And, uh, but the archery teacher had this other student named Dhruvya, and Dhruvya was a very sincere and dedicated student, and he kept getting better and better and better at archery, and to the point where he was beating Arjuna, and Arjuna said, hey, you, teacher, you made me this promise, you've got to get rid of this guy. So the teacher had to abide by his promise, so he sent Dhruvya away. And uh, Dhruvi uh, built a statue of the teacher and just worshipped the statue and de 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 dedicated himself to the statue and kept practicing archery and got to the point where he was really good, you know, way better than Arjuna, just from having the statue as his teacher. But it was really his determination as a student that mm -hmm. yielded the, the results. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, after realization, there is definitely an energy that comes through the body of the realized individual. But this energy has nothing to do with the teacher. It's not something that you can turn it on and off. And what I've noticed is that this energy sometimes is very strong. And, um, um, and, and, and actually, when it's very strong coming through this body, uh, <laughs> Leo can't even sit next to me. <laughs> Can't even sleep in the same bed. It just upsets him too much. You mm. know, like um, it stirs him up. Mm -hmm. um, so he goes and sit on the other side of the couch. <laughs> and so, oh, there he is again. <laughs> um, but it's nothing to do with the. With, it's not a conscious thing. And I've noticed that um, this energy seems to have um, seems to respond to the openness of the other to this energy. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I look at someone and my eyes starts watering, they feel really hot, and I know that there is this energy, but I know that it's almost the other person that is drawing it out. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with me, really. Honestly, nothing, that's the pure truth. And it reminds me a bit like, um, probably women that have breastfed relate to this. When I was in my 20s and I had my child and I was breastfeeding him, the child was in another room, and as soon I heard the child crying, the, the milk started flowing. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do, with, and actually what happened, so it, 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 it seems funny, but it works like that. It's not like the mother thinks, oh, now I have to feed the baby. It's just in, in built in there. Yeah. It's, it's just spontaneous, and it works the same way with this energy. He told and, that funny um, story about the restaurant. Remember the restaurant? We, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell it just for fun? Sure, sure. Um, well, when I was um, actually breastfeeding, um, I like I like to go out. I like to sit in coffee shop and look at people. And so I would take my baby Jonathan, and um, and uh, and then if he needed to be fed, I would just feed him. And uh, so I was having my coffee, and uh, the baby cry, and so I get him to put him on my breast, and so the milk is starting to flow because he's crying. But before I could put him on my breast, the milk shoot out a couple of meters to the table of the people next door. So it was quite embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, now the so. principle here, obviously, is that it's the openness and willingness of the student that elicits the giving from the teacher. Yes. That's, that's the principle yes. you're trying to make. And it's not from the teacher. It's the giving from that divine impulse that once awakened anybody that is ready to be awakened yeah it's teacher like... is just a vehicle she can't turn it on you know it's not as if uh, the teacher can go oh I, li I like you and now i'm going to give you this energy it right. doesn't work like that at all it's like a, you know a reservoir of water a great big reservoir i mean if you put a drinking straw up to it not very much water can flow through if you put a, a bigger pipe up to it then more water if you put a great big huge you know pipe then a lot of water can flow so so the reservoir is the same but it, yes. a lot depends on how, how big the pipe is, so to speak, how, yeah. how receptive and, the student is. And the role of the teacher really is to try to be out of the way as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> not to, not to, um, to open up to this 
energy and let it do what he wants to do instead of trying to direct it. Yeah. So, so this brings up a beautiful point, which is that, you know, what is a teacher but, rather, but just divine consciousness, um, a, a vehicle, we could say, through which divine consciousness can flow unimpeded. You know, you just said, out of the way, be out of the way. And most, yes. of, most people and are kind of in the way of divine consciousness. Yes. They're, they're, yes. they're not a really obstacle-free conduit, you know, th yeah. through which divine yeah. consciousness can flow and express. Yeah, and, and it's never-ending, this process. That it's not as if a realization suddenly, you know, I have to be the perfect conduit for God, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you just, you just, you just learn and you keep on stretching and you keep on growing. There's never ending to the process. Yeah. That's kind of what we were talking about in the very beginning, that um, in a way, realization, self-realization is the beginning. And, and after that, then the vehicle keeps getting refined, purified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, in, in a way, well, at the beginning of our spiritual journey, um, the progress, if we want to call it that, is um, is assessed by the degree of of uh, inner expansion. In the as we get into progressively more subtle um, inner territory, for lack of another word, um, then the progress is assessed um, with difficulty because. Um, it require it's what actually happens is the dissolution of um, the self in 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 the absolute small so the, self right yes yeah that of the small self into the divine mm -hmm. and um, and there are degrees you know and this is um, this is the job I guess uh, of after uh, the realization of our transcendence um, the what some people call purification on the vehicle and it can take um, many years uh, the entire lifetime and maybe there is never ending mm. to degrees that you can actually um, dissolve more and more into the divine so that there is nothing left so um, why do you think that in some spiritual circles progressive development is a dirty word you know why why do some people have a problem with that <laughs> Well, they have a problem. You know what I mean, well, right? I mean, some people, oh, you're progressive, you know, they're, they're, and I'm not progress. I'm not. I don't have a progressive orientation. Yeah. Um, well, it's what we talked before. You know, we are awareness, and as awareness, there is nothing we need to do. Mm -hmm. But unless this is being directly realized, it's not going to do any good. It's right. just, it's just a game we're playing. It's just, uh, yeah. but it's also part of the journey, you know, we've all been there. And is there ever, has there ever been anyone who has directly realized awareness and embodied it to the greatest possible extent that it can be embodied? Is, is that even possible, much less precedented? I don't, know. I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I think it's an ongoing thing. I don't think any human being can actually um, do that. It, you know, I haven't done, my realization was about eight years ago. I haven't done really much teaching apart the ones that directly have communicated with me through emails. And I've done a six weeks course, um, um, mainly to test uh, my different practices that I had. Um, and the reason for that is in some traditions, and I believe in that is that after realization you need to be they tell you you need to be at least 10 years yeah, yeah. Uh, maturing and uh, you know and um, and I think some some people they get um, a realization their transcendence and they immediately start teaching right and I think it can be a bit unsettling because I've changed so much since since when it happened seven eight years ago you know uh, at the beginning I was a little bit um, radical i guess there's nothing to do um yes but i've mellowed yeah yeah and that comes with experience and maturity of this energy yeah yeah we'll talk more about um as we go along in this conversation we'll talk more about um 
you know, spiritual maturation and, um, you know, the, what qualifies one to start teaching or whether some people might be trying to teach prematurely. Um, but a question just came in, which I want to read to you. Um, Dan from London asks, you have talked a bit about lucid dreaming. I have also had a lot of lucid dreaming as a child and always wondered how it was different from waking reality. In later years, I've realized that perhaps the exploration of lucid dreams can be a tool to explore reality. For example, in the lucid dreaming state, I will often wonder at the source of the reality of the dream. Do you think that lucid dreaming can be a tool to be used on the path to enlightenment? And if so, how might this be the case? Absolutely. Uh, lucid dreaming is a, a, a very valuable tool um, on the path of awakening. And there are some traditions which uh, I've studied, like Zochen, where it's a big part of, uh, of waking up, and mainly because um, we, we, can get a we can get a glimpse of our nature easier in, the, in lucid dreaming than we can, uh, because more or less the mind is out of the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's more directly accessible, and uh, and also when uh, when we start having regular lucid dreaming, we start realizing that um, there's no difference between uh, a lucid dream and ordinary life. You know, mm. it's it's the same. It's all one thing. It's all one consciousness. Yeah, the most powerful and dramatic awakening I ever had was in a dream, actually. Uh, it was just mm. really in profound. Um, is we tend to dismiss them. We, te we tend to dismiss uh, dreams, but um, in some tradition, like what I just mentioned, Zhou Chen, uh, uh, they're actually used uh, very much for uh, unfoldment and awakening. Yeah. It would seem that and see if you agree with this, that um, one the reason that is the case is that during dreams, or during even during sleep, if sleep is wakeful, that there's a, it's a much more innocent state where, you know, there's much less tendency to be controlling or gripping. With, yes, with, yes. And, and the mind has got less yeah, power. Yeah, more fluid, more malleable. Mm. Yes, definitely, absolutely, mm. yeah. So would you actually advocate um, somehow culturing uh, the ability to dream lucidly is that as a practice? As I said, I haven't got yet much um, practice in teaching. I, I have a few students and um, that I work with. Mm -hmm. um, do you somehow uh, en uh, enable them or encourage them to do lucid dreaming? What I actually, what I actually do, I actually um, tune in what they need, mm. um, tune in to what they need, and um, and I actually help them to discover for themselves what they need for the yeah. next step. I think I found that this is the best way. Uh -huh. So it may because be everybody... dreaming, but it may be something else. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> um, in your book, and I think maybe also in your talk with Jerry Katz, I heard you talking a lot about um, effort versus non-effort and how as you understand meditation, it's a very effortless, natural process. In fact, you were talking about studying with some Zen teacher, and the Zen teacher was talking about controlling your mind and not letting your mind wander and space out and all that. And you were saying, yeah, but my natural inclination is just to sort of relax into a vast, settled state. Let, let's talk about yes. the role of effort um, in a practice or, yes. or effortlessness. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, when I was attending, I've done many... Uh, meditation retreats in mm -hmm. the past with different traditions mm -hmm. and um, so I guess if we start talking with that and even with the one that I did here uh, the six weeks you know sometime you look at a person and they're all very genuine um, but you know you see some that are sitting there very rigid um, the faces is really hard and you think um, they're trying to do something, right? You can see it in their face. They're just trying to nail something down. And then on the other side, you have uh, some uh, meditators that um, are really loose and relaxed, almost some fall asleep. And uh, they've got this uh, strange smile on their face and you think, oh, they must be having good dreams. Mm. 
there is something in common with these two types. Mm -hmm. um, the minute that you brush them or touch them on the shoulders or there is a sudden noise in the room, they jump out startled. And this is, this is to me is proof that they were not here. They were just fabricating something in their mind. The first one was fabricating some, some uh, really hard thing to, to hold, to grab, and just some state some mind state and the other one they were fabricating something nicer but it it just proves that we're not here and um the old practice the meditation practice is to be here if you have to come back from somewhere um then it's not it's not really it it might be good for concentration purposes or it might be good for relaxation you know what i call snoring meditation <laughs> that's fine sleep attention but, uh, that's right. That's right. And but you know, a person can meditate like that for many years and um, not get any progress. You know, progress. You know. Um, so I guess the, the the practice is our awareness is composed of two mind qualities. Uh, one side is the luminosity, uh, what we call the cognizing aspect, um, the intelligence that allows us to notice everything that is happening and the other side of awareness is what in some tradition is called emptiness or relaxation an mm. openness that allows everything to be in it and um, if we stray too much on one direction we become controlling of our experiences and we tend to fall into thoughts because of it and if we stray too much on the direction of the emptiness we become too vague, uh, spaced out, dull, um, and awareness is neither controlling or dull like a, a drug-induced state. It's like brightly alert, and but also relaxed because there is nothing we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that luminosity, that cognizing mm -hmm. aspect, brightly alert to everything that is happening, but also deeply relaxed because there is nothing that we're trying to nail down, basically. Mm. And so this is what I call in the book, the instant presence, where, you know, for example, this moment, you know, for example, if I do that, everybody's hearing that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how come we are hearing that? Because in each one of us, there is this wakefulness um, that is always present, independent of our thinking. Now, this is the secret, and if, you know, they're all secret of all this entire interview, of all the entire book. Oh, you can get okay. this, you can go home. Okay, okay, everybody, pay attention. Pay attention, pay <laughs> attention. This is it. This moment of pure wakefulness, if it's left as it is, it is pure awareness. Mm -hmm. Our natural state is that close. But if this moment of pure wakefulness moves towards the thought, an emotion, a judgment, it becomes our ordinary mind, mm. which also perceives, but now is split in duality, subject, object. So in our day to day life, what do we do? We are constantly um, chasing thoughts, we're constantly judging everything. Right. So the, the practice of instant presence is basically, or any practice that does that, is to reverse this thing of the mind or what it does. And because the mind uh, existence depend on this continual movement, because awareness at rest is your true nature. Awareness in movement is your ordinary mind. So we want to reverse that and we want to just rest like this moment, for example, we just rest in this moment and we are aware of uh, sitting in the chair. Maybe we can aware, we are aware of sounds happening around us. Now we don't move from sound to sound. We're not trying to nail anything. It's better to have your eyes open. I know that in some meditation, you close your eyes, but for this, we wanna be able to, to do it all the time, not just on, on the meditation cushion. When we're walking, when we are eating or whatever, we wanna open up to everything. It's almost like a 360 degree opening um, as much as we can. And also we want to be fully relaxed. 
the right balance is probably 50 50. If you go one way, you become too controlling. If you go the other way, you become too dull. Mm -hmm. The right balance is brightly alert and deeply relaxed. And you can actually adjust that in yourself. And there are some different little practices. You know, for example, if you start becoming dull, you just a sharp and deep um, uh, wakefulness aspect by, you know, being more bright. And maybe this is like put your body a bit more straight. If you're starting to become too controlling, just allow more relaxation in, you know, which feels like a, bit, like a sponge being filled with water and maintain the balance. And obviously, because our mind is always, uh, actually, if because awareness is always used to, to go and become the mind, um, at first we might be able to maintain this balance for a few minutes or seconds. But that's all right. We keep on going back until this becomes longer and longer. And um, and this is basically the practice. This is all we're doing. And um, we do it with the eyes open because we want to be able to do it driving. It's It makes you an excellent driver because um, you're very alert. And also it makes you a nicer driver <laughs> because you're relaxed. You're not mm -hmm. going to abuse anybody, cutting you off or anything like that. Did you practice something of this nature uh, yourself prior to realization, or is this something that you kind of came up with to help people okay. afterwards? What happened is I was, um, this was probably four or five years before uh, realization, and I'd done other practices, and at that time I was doing the breath meditation, at the, mm -hmm. uh, the Zen type of meditation. And, um, and one day um, I, uh, I just heard a sound in, in the valley. This meditation center was in beautiful part of Adelaide, Adelaide Hills. I heard a, a dog barking and somehow it felt like that dog was barking within myself. Mm. And then I heard another sound, somebody coughed in the room and again, you know, and suddenly it was like I was the space that contained all these sounds that were arising. And so what I did, it only lasted a very short time, but what I did, I tried to repeat that by opening up to the sounds around myself. So it was like it was like I was being guided and also I was having dreams towards this technique and I never really encountered I had encountered other varieties of it and actually it was um, only in the last couple of years that I've met this um, Zochen master, uh, deeply enlightened man and um, he actually has some not like this technique but a variation and when I, I, I talked to him he actually said oh you must have been in Tibet with us mm. you know you're one of us uh -huh. yeah um, so it was a variation of what he was already teaching not quite exactly the same and he, he was amazed that well actually he wasn't amazed that um, somehow I got it, you know, yeah. I, I told, I told him that I had some Tibetan teachers that were teaching me in that period. Yeah. Mm. There's yeah. a, there's a Vedic saying, be easy to us with gentle effort. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, exactly. Absolutely. And when I learned mm. to meditate back in the sixties, the principle of it was that it had to be effortless and that, um, effort would only interfere with the process because effort, mm. effort tends to sort of agitate the mind and, and keep yes. it keep it from settling and becoming vast, yes. you know, settling down yes. and becoming vast. Yeah. And and also there's this principle that the mind does have a natural tendency to seek a field of greater happiness and that the more settled state is more charming and more more fulfilling to, to the mind. Yes. And so if if you're making an effort, then you prevent yourself from settling into that. But if you yes. if you proceed effortlessly, then you keep encountering greater and greater and greater charm. And so the, the mind kind of naturally moves in that direction without having to yes. be forced. Yes. It's kind of like the difference between yeah. if you want to keep a dog at your door, you can either chain it up and the dog mm -hmm. is straining against the chain, or you can put some food there and the dog just comes and <laughs> sits at the door. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And we must remember that the mind it's not like the enemy. The mind is actually awareness in movement. Um, awareness in movement. Mm -hmm. There is only one thing, one force. And yeah. 
awareness, a rest is our natural state. Awareness in movement is our ordinary mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not the enemy. Yeah, it's true of the physiology too. It's, it's unhealthy and unnatural for the physiology to be hyper-stimulated all the time. You know, there might be in situations in which it needs to be to, re to respond to something, but one becomes habituated sometimes if there's constant stress and the, the, you know, the whole blood chemistry is thrown off and there's just this constant agitation in the body which is unnatural and unhealthy. And, you know, it's much more natural for the body to be in a sort of a state of ease and equilibrium and function in that, in that condition. Um, and so I think what you're talking about is something which might be able to inculcate that kind of um, style of functioning. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Um, however, uh, you know, the way you presented it, you know, you said, well, you could be in this in this sort of, you know, you can be in this state, and that is self-realization, at least a brief glimpse of it. But the, as soon as the thoughts percolate up, then you, you get drawn off. And so it's, that implies that it's very delicate at first, or very, very tenuous. Very delicate, yeah. yes. And that it has like, to be stabilized in some way. And the stabilization happens by every time we find ourselves, we are somewhere else with our mm -hmm. thoughts. We just bring it back. No judgment. We, we don't put any judgment, oh, I should have done that, I spiced out, whatever. And also the moment that you remember to come back, you're already back. Mm. So there is no effort. Um, so it's just like little drops, little drops, little moments of wakefulness, mm -hmm. and then another, and then another, and, um, and they get longer and longer. And then the old thing, you know, right now, most people, we have this uh, this thing where we the default position is the mind thinking, judging everything, and eventually the whole thing switches, and the default position is the mind at rest, you know, awareness at rest, and um, and we still can use the mind. It's not as if we become some mush and we can't do anything. We can't we can't function in the world and we can't feed ourselves and we can't work and we can't look after our family, not at all. We, we actually become a lot more um, uh, efficient, I guess, in mm. life, you know, more efficient, more alive, more connected. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. There's a, a verse in the Gita which goes, yoga karma sukoshalam, which means yoga is skill in action. And yoga, of course, means union. And so the, the principle there is that if you can get established in a unified state, uh, then on that foundation, you can actually be much more skillful in action than, than not, than otherwise. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There are some things after realization, and I'm not sure whether this is something that happens to everybody, that I've noticed that seem to deteriorate. <laughs> memory is one yeah, of them. Yeah, you were saying Somehow your memory. Somehow, it's like I find myself, uh, you know, my job is quite um, detailed, um, uh, you know, with publishing and stuff. And uh, I, things that I've done for years and years and years, uh, every time I do it again, that action, it feels like I'm doing it for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so something like that, it's getting a little bit better. It was really shocking when it first happened. I mean, I was having uh, weird things, you know, Leo knows, you know, we would be um, meeting in town um, and usually would like to go to a music shop and I would like to sit in a coffee shop again, watching people. And then after a while, he'll come back and, uh, you know, wait for me to get up to join him. And I would just be looking at him. And to me, honestly, he was like, I didn't know him. Who is this man looking at me? Who is this strange man? <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. And 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 he's looking at me, and um, and he's thinking, uh, you know, he's seeing this face. You know, and after a while, he was used to it. It's like the minute he moved out of my consciousness, then he was like, when he came back in, I had to readjust to, mm. to recognize him. It's really weird. You should have had a little sign. Hi, I'm Leo. Happening. I'm Leo. It's I'm not, your partner. Not, no, he was like. <laughs> Who is the old man looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Well, I think this is just a phase, though, right? I mean, it is a phase. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an integration it's phase. It's not happening as much anymore. No, right. it's not anything. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, people, Byron Katie, you know, she had to learn how to brush her teeth again and stuff after her awakening, yeah. and you know, yeah. Eckhart Tolle wasn't good for much other than sitting on a park bench for a couple of years. Yeah. You know, so sometimes the, even when the transcendent especially when it comes on very uh, suddenly it's, and fully, you know, it can take quite some shock. time to learn yes. to function again. Yes, yes, absolutely. I didn't get that bad, uh, mainly because I've got a very demanding job. I've mm -hmm. got more than one job. I've got 30 different hats that I have to wear yeah. every day. And, um, and so in a way it was like root shock. I had to, I had to, I had to make it work. And yeah. so I had notes everywhere. Um, trying to remember things and uh, stuff like that. And I think that in a way was good because he, he got me to be a bit more integrated, you know, integrated. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's good. I mean, if you had yeah. been able to just sit in the garden and stare at the flowers. I wanted to do that. Yeah, you, you wanted know, to I do really that. I really wanted yeah. to do that. I really, I, I just wanted to go into a cabin in the middle of nowhere and live the rest of my life there. I realize now that there would have been a very selfish thing to do but that's how I felt yeah divine had other plans for you yeah yes and you know when when you're asked to descend you might refuse you know and eventually you know it's like you come down you know partly because of the love uh, that you feel for the beloved and partly because you know that if you continue to resist you you might be kicked down here again yeah you might be a mm. I think there is no choice. There's no, you know, this is part of the plan. There's no, no yeah. other way. That's another verse from the Gita, you know, you know yoga stakur karmani, established in yoga, perform action. So it's not just like we get established in yoga and just veg out, you know, but no. have to perform. And because, I mean, wouldn't you say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but true realization is not, it's something that's going to be um, there under all conditions, you know, whether yes. whether you are, you know, doing something, driving in heavy traffic or yes. sitting, looking at the flowers. It has to, and if it can't be yes. re maintained under all conditions, then it's not really a true realization or not really a, yes. a mature realization. Absolutely. Yeah. Has to be lived. In, in fact, like I've met this amazing... Uh, monks from different tradition, um, um, the ones that I'm talking about right now, I'm thinking are Tibetan ones. And, you know, they must sit and meditate for hours. Mm -hmm. And when the bell ring, they are fully here, alert, they get up and on with their task. There is no adjusting, there is nothing. They're just in the world and they're so very efficient. You know, some sometime in meditation retreats, you see people, you know, after the two couple of hours of meditation, they come out and they're all spicy and, you know, soft. They have to readjust to the world. There's none of that. It's yeah. just here, 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 fully integrated. And that's where you notice, you know, some of these um, long term meditators. I met this um, beautiful um, monk that he, he had, had been a monk since he was three years old and he was now like, I think it was 97 mm. and it was just amazing. He couldn't speak a word of English, but we still communicated. Huh. It was lovely. He was a lovely man. Speaking of monks, um, you told this story about how when you were a little girl, you used to, well, you told it earlier in this interview, how you used to float above the rooftops in a bubble or yeah. something like that. And then yes. I heard you tell a story where you actually met an old monk yes. who said that yes. when he was a young monk, he used to, in his meditation, yes. he used to see this little girl floating in a bubble. Tell us that yes. story. Yes, um, this was like um, Norbu, uh, that's his name, he's uh, a Dzogchen teacher. And um, we were invited to, to interview him, um, would have been, I don't know, three, four, five years ago maybe. And, um, and we went there, and naturally Leo knows all these stories because I told him, right? And, um, and we were sitting there and he was doing his uh, two hours talk in the morning. And he starts talking about this, uh, when you know when, a, when he was a monk and he was in meditation and um, he would always see this little girl in a bubble dressed with this um, 
velvet dress, velvet green dress with little daisies at the bottom. Well, that was my dress. <laughs> uh, my auntie used to make all my dresses. Um, we never bought shop, uh, shop dresses. And uh, I had this, uh, my favorite dress was this velvet, dark velvet green uh, dress with daisies at the bottom. And, um, and when we heard that, you know, I was sitting closer to him, so sort of towards the front, and Leo was sitting a little bit at the back, and I turned to look at him, and he was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's you, <laughs> what's going on? And yeah. so, so this monk had experienced that back 30, 40 years ago when you yeah. were actually having the, the floating in a bubble experience. Uh, yeah, and, but then, you know, time and space, as I said before, it's all, it's all you know, pushed, it's not yeah. really linear. Yeah. yeah. Not linear, so that's amazing. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Now, um, and that's why I felt a very strong um, resonance with this teacher before we met him. Mm -hmm. We had never met him before, and I kept on seeing his picture in various uh, Shambhala magazine or whatever Leo buys, and I kept on saying to Leo, oh, "It's like he's calling me from the picture. It's like there is a connection, mm. and there was a connection." Yeah, that's cool. Mm. Um, I heard you say that um, you always had this feeling like in this lifetime you were just destined to be realized. It was just going to happen, and you were pretty, you were kind of <laughs> kind of sloppy as a as a spiritual practitioner compared to Leo, for instance, and compared to some other people. You know, you're just like, eh, hey, meditate, not meditate, whatever. But I'm, yes. I'm, it's going to yes. happen. You know? <laughs> and, yes, and yes, it, yes. And it happened. Yeah, yeah. And Leo knows, and uh, you know, it's like we've been together sort of a. 30, over 30 years, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I've always told him that, and he, he, he sounded, um, if somebody heard me, sounded, oh, she's like, opposite. you know, she doesn't want to do anything, she thinks somehow mm -hmm. she's going to be special to get this thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't like that at all, it wasn't like a feeling, it felt like this lifetime is my turn. Uh, I, I don't know. You just had a um, premonition or something. Yeah, and 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 I know I've worked really, really hard in past lives. Oh. I've worked really hard. Paid your dues. And uh, hmm? you paid yeah. your dues. <laughs> yeah, and it was just an internal feeling. It, it it wasn't in my mind. It was more in my heart that told me, uh, yeah. this this time is your time. Okay, so we've alluded a lot to your awakening, to your realization, and we've kind of done that in a way that takes, just sort of takes it for granted that everybody knows exactly what you experienced when you had this realization, but I don't think they necessarily do. So, you know, tell us about the actual experience of this realization that we've been discussing. Mm. Okay. Um, mm, no more drink. <laughs> <laughs> Leo, bring her a drink. Leo can Actually, have but, but don't don't make I've it really coffee. I think that. she's had enough coffee. No, just yes. I feel buzzing actually. <laughs> um, okay. Um, what actually happened, Leo? I don't need a I don't need a drink actually. Yeah. Um, what actually happened is um, that I was doing this type of. Um, meditation, well, I, what I now call instant presence. Uh, I've been doing it for several years at this meditation retreat, a local meditation retreat. Um, we used to meditate um, Tuesday and Saturday half a day, and then um, once a month we used to have a four days retreat, and then seven days retreat every second month. Um, we did that for a long time. and. Um, I think Leo's giving me the drink. All right. <laughs> so That's okay. You can use it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So anyway, um, and so I'd been doing that for a while, and um, and a few months before the realization happened, here is with the drink. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Leo. Oh, thank you. Thanks. My mouth is really dry. I must have been talking oh, a lot. I'm glad you got it. <laughs> um, and so I, um, in the last few months, uh, uh, before the, the realization day. happened, yeah, yeah um, I started getting lots of energy in my body. 
uh, sometimes the energy was so strong it was shaking the body and um, naturally I told the meditation teacher and she said this is a good sign you know keep going keep going by the way she knew that I was doing something different than what she was teaching and uh, well at first she was a little bit like well, I don't know because she didn't know about this particular thing and she thought I would be lost in the mind but somehow she knows that I was doing something different um, and anyway I said uh, she said this is a good sign keep going and um, and then we did this seven days retreat and it was the last day of the retreat in the morning um, and um, so I set for uh, the last session and then we would have lunch and then everybody would go home and um, the minute that I sat within like maybe first few minutes um, I started feeling this um, first this intense energy coming coming up and it was so strong that he actually scared me um, and then um, I closed my eyes again and I saw this um, what I can only describe as a black reflective surface. Um, my attention was caught by it. And, um, and when I looked at it, still all happening on, on, the, on the inner, um, I, just, uh, I just realized that I was uh, watching myself moving. But the self wasn't the self that I knew myself to be. It wasn't this self. It, and it was something so um, big and terrifying, terrifying, <clears throat> that um, my mind just fainted. Um, I, I, I just, uh, I just couldn't, even now, I can't actually even talk about it. Really? Uh, I, I just I just say it was like dark radiance. You can't talk um, about it because it's hard to describe or you can't talk about it because it brings up feelings of that terror that you experienced? No, no, no. It, it's just, I don't know what words Hard to, to describe. Use. Yeah, okay. Yeah, very hard to describe. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. A dark, reflective surface, right? <laughs> doesn't say much. Right. And yet there was so much. Contradiction in terms, really. Yeah, yeah. And um, anyway... All I remember, the next thing that I remember was the bell that announced the walking meditation, 10 minutes. And, um, and I heard the bell and then, you know, I didn't even know who I was. And I noticed my, ha my hand, I didn't know it was my hand. I noticed a hand move, you know, all this sort of stuff, weird stuff. And, but then somehow it's almost even though I didn't know what was going on, I, uh, my body actually got up by itself as if it had an intelligent independent from the brain which wasn't there at that moment and the body got up and went outside and um, and then slowly you know um, I started seeing uh, everything appeared bright and and there was this love everywhere and this unity um, and uh, I sat there I didn't I didn't go to do the walking meditation and then lunch came and, um, and there was this thing where um, we prepared lunch in turns and this lady that had meditated there for many years, like she came out and she asked me a question because I had done the salad the day before and so she wanted to know where I put something and, and I hear my, my, the words come out of my mouth um, and she seemed to accept that she doesn't think there is anything wrong with me. So uh, obviously I still look normal to her and uh, she didn't say oh what's wrong with you or nothing you know and the, but the, the words come out without me thinking of anything you know by themselves and um, I wanted to talk about it to the meditation teacher but there were too many people and so we decided to go home and I, obviously I told Leo on the way home um, and he was like what was it what was it? I said I don't know I, my mind can't even comprehend what it was and then but it was still I going just, on even on the way home right it, this isn't just an experience was, which came and went it was it was going on yeah but by night time it was almost gone and and so and so I didn't think anything of it because 
you know, I've always had experiences like this and they always had a beginning, middle and hand. And I thought this was another one of the same kind. Um, and, um, and then I remember that night I started feeling really sick uh, in bed and started coughing up this mucusy stuff. And I was, I was sick for about almost a month. Uh, I was in bed and uh, a few times the, the teacher, the meditation teacher rang me because she was, because we were always there and I couldn't even talk to her. I was coughing and coughing and coughing. Mm. And then um, did, one morning. Did you ever hour, smoke when I, you were young? Never, okay. never smoked. Or, okay. No, can, never. Can. Uh, um, and, um, uh, and then sort of a, one morning I wake up and we had a dog and I ran my dog and we decided to take him for a walk because I was feeling better. And Leo, Leo was walking in front um, and we live in a sort of a hilly in the foothill of Adelaide. So it's a bit hilly. And I remember that he was walking in front with the dog. And, um, and I just looked over the valley like this. And as soon as I did that, suddenly it was like, I saw that everything that I was looking was all inside me. Mm. Um, like those mini experiences that I already had had. But this was a bit different because there was no actual separation between uh, what I was seeing and our person seeing them. Sort of it's like everything was arising and dissolving and everything was me and everywhere I looked was me. So that was, the, but while this sounds, sounds fantastic, also was the thing this has always been like this and I, I never noticed. I could have missed it. And I, I did remember that when I was a child, I was seeing things like that and just I pretended I didn't mm. because for fitting in, you know, so it wasn't like a fantastic thing. Like some of the experiences that I had previously, they were fantastic. This was like felt very ordinary, very, very sort of, a, you know, like almost like when you see those those things that change, you know, they go to two images mm -hmm. and you go, oh, there it is, yeah. you know, and that's how it was, you know, and, and it was, how could I miss this? Look, everything. And, you know, I rushed to tell Leo and, and he thought, oh, she's still sick. She's not making <laughs> sense because I couldn't find the words to describe what I was seeing. I was saying, I am everywhere. So he thought that I meant confused, you know, like spiced out. Right. I am everywhere. And and this is what I also told the teacher a few days after. And she was like, oh, what do you mean you are everywhere? You know, she couldn't understand it at first. Yeah, but I was, I didn't have the words to explain it. And um, yeah, and, um, and that's what happened. Yeah, you feel that that, um, that month of sickness was some kind of a, purging that had to take place before the realization could happen? Some kind of a prepara preparation phase? I think so. I think so. I think so. Because I, I, the doctor came at home and gave me all the stuff and I was taking the antibiotics and all this and they were not doing anything. Yeah. They were not doing anything until I was done. Yeah. Until, you know, I coughed up all this stuff. This kind of stuff has happened to other people. St. Francis of Assisi went through something like that. He got really sick before his awakening. And Really? Yeah. Um, and I if you ever that. watch the movie Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, he almost died. And then he, when he came out of it, he was like, <laughs> big right. change. Uh, and yeah. there are a lot of other stories in it's, various spiritual traditions of people going through a real intense catharsis, you know, physical uh, stuff. Um, uh, uh, yeah. And then, my, and then when, that, said, when they work through that, then boom, there's a, a clarity. Yeah. 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 yeah I find the body uh, for me personally uh the bodies were uh the one that gets affected usually yeah uh, like that. Mm. well it's the instrument through which this is lived is it not yeah yeah well some people i've talked to some other people they it's more like their mind or their depression maybe and stuff like that i never really had any of that it's always uh, my body that um seems to suffer <laughs> uh, getting adjusted to the energy you know yeah. Well, even if it's their mind and depression and so on, that there are neurophysiological correlates to that. You know, there, yeah. there are things happening in their brain chemistry and whatnot that correlate yeah. with depression. So, but, yeah. but basically the point I'm bringing out is that, that I think that, the, well, as Jesus said, the body is the temple of the soul and, and it's the, the, the brain and nervous system and body are the instrument through which we live realization. And 
you can't, as Jesus again said, you can't pour new wine into old wineskins. You know, the, the wineskin, so to speak, the vessel has to be fit to hold the new wine. Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's what happens. <laughs> and Ramana Mahashi said uh, it's like an elephant entering a tent. Good point. Or something along those lines, right? Sometimes it does a little bit of damage. Yeah. yeah. Or else the mm. tent has to be expanded <laughs> to, to accommodate mm. the elephant. The elephant, yeah. 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 Maybe it has to be so, taken apart. So in a way, it's good for people that uh, this stuff happens for some of us. That has happened slowly and gradually has expanded their ability to be able to contain this energy. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people that get it all at once without any preparation. Can burn them out. Sometimes it really throws them. I've got a friend, she works, uh, she's a nurse mm -hmm. in a mental hospital in Adelaide, mm -hmm. and she, she's sort of a tuned in to spiritual stuff, and she tells me a lot of people there, they've had premature awakening, yeah. and they couldn't contain it. Mm. Interesting Kundalini point. awakening, and, um, you know, and she's there sort of trying to help as best as she could, but unfortunately, they just fill them up with drugs. I know it's a shame because, and, and that's what all these traditions like Ayurveda and yoga and whatnot are about. They're about, you know, making the physiology capable of sustaining awakening. Uh, yes. and, and you can actually end up in a mental hospital if it's not capable. So uh, and a lot of times those things are dismissed by some spiritual seekers as just being a, a, a fixation on the physical or, a you know, they're, they're not really going for the essence of the, of the spiritual teaching, but they're really part of the package. And, Having, yes. a, having a value so, for being able to sustain the shock of awakening. Yes, absolutely. Totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah. that has been my experience. You, you, you really need to look after the body. Right. If now, I have to really be careful what I um, put into this body, especially when there is um, some abundance of energy, because uh, it, it does all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. The body, yeah. And it's a shame about your friend uh, and, and who works in that mental hospital. Shame for those people who have had Kundalini awakenings and so on, or end yeah. up in a hospital because if they had the proper care under the in the hands of someone who knew what they were doing, uh, you know what has happened to them could be experienced as a great blessing. It is a great blessing, yeah. but they've yeah. just fallen into the wrong hands. Yes, and some people awakened without doing absolutely anything. Yeah. It just it just happened to them, and I guess that's what threw them out of balance. They didn't even understand what was going on. They had nothing, nothing to. So they just went to the doctor, and they were put on drugs. I guess. And you know, I think it's becoming actually more common these days because awakening is there's some, some sort of epidemic going on in the world. And, there is. Uh, yeah, really. In terms of more and more people it is. awakening. It is. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. Definitely, there is a shift in consciousness things are happening a lot of people are waking up probably because to counterbalance some of the stuff that is happening in the world yeah try to exactly bring yeah. some i think that's an important point and so as a culture you know and as a medical you know the medical community and all that really have to gain an understanding of, of this because they're going to encounter it more than more and more and yes um and it's happening i mean there are more and more people i mean the next interview i'm going to do after this one two weeks from now I'm skipping next week, uh, will be with a, a woman named Joan Harrigan, who has a, kun, a, a place in Tennessee, which is a U.S. state, called Kundalini Care. And, and she actually, a number of my friends have gone there, and, and she helps people who are having a Kundalini awakening, whose Kundalini might be misdirected or blocked or something or other, and uh, helps them sort of get it going in the right direction so that they can blossom into a, a realization without difficulties and uh, yeah. problems. Yeah, I've, I've heard uh, from one of my teachers that um, at one meditation retreat, actually even through meditation, sometimes people can have happening too fast, you know, yeah. and they had to be taken to the hospital. But fortunately, in that case, you know, the the teacher sort of was looking after them, so they yeah. didn't end up in the mental hospital full of drugs. Now, that's an important point, too, because, I mean, on the one hand, there are people who have spontaneous awakenings. They don't know what it is and so on and so forth. But then there are other people who are spiritual seekers and they get all gung-ho about awakening. And maybe they start doing three hours of fast pranayama or, you know, yes. just, you know, some kind of intense thing. Yeah. And they end up blowing fuses. 
So you yeah. have to have the safety per first principle when you're approaching this this stuff. Absolutely, yeah. You need to know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I would. I wouldn't personally. I wouldn't uh, necessarily play around with the Kundalini um, without knowing exactly what you're doing. It's a bit. Uh, it can be very dangerous. dangerous. It can be very dangerous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it was Gopi Krishna who wrote a book about Kundalini, his own experience, and it was, you know, just hellacious, the, the stuff he went through. Um, so, you know, in a, in a way, we're, it's, we're playing with fire. It's divine fire, but um, there's a real merit to having the proper guidance and, and proceeding yeah. in, a, in a sensible way. Yeah. I, uh, when I was young, uh, you know, sort of in my 20s, one of the things that I actually explored was some practice that was meant to awaken the kundalini mm -hmm. and i immediately started having experiences you know like uh, this fire coming up onto my head and i thought that my head was going to explode and as soon as that happened uh the teacher came there and was trying to help me but it was like then i think i squashed it down and happened a few times and uh that night i had a dream and it was a lucid dream and um a teacher gave me uh like a, a blow up thing, you know, and I started blowing into it and it was a snake huh. at first, mm. right? It was, a, I was blowing up this toy snake, but then all of a sudden the snake become alive mm -hmm. and I couldn't control it anymore. It was a huge python. Mm. And to me that was, you know, the teacher was, was saying, don't play with this. Interesting. And I stopped, I huh. stopped. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. And of course, snake, yeah. snake, and Kundalini. That, that that's right. I, I got the symbol. Yeah. I was saying, you, right now, you think you're just in control, but once the python awakens, you won't be able to contain it. Wow. So, it's just, yeah. That's cool that you got that's, that guidance. That's the value. That's the value of that dream guidance, I guess, that we can tune into. Yeah. And that brings up a whole interesting point: is who is who are these guys that guide us in our dreams? I mean, are there somehow beings <laughs> hanging around, and they actually ultimately, yeah. ultimately, it's only awareness. Right. Ult ultimately, is that one being that that is doing everything and taking the shape of everything, yeah. a stone or anything, you know? But obviously, yeah, on a relative level, there are beings um, oh, like God. there are spiritual teachers here mm -hmm. on Earth and. On, on other planes, I guess, talking in relative terms. Yeah. But ultimately, it's just awareness that takes on all those shapes. Sure. Yeah. Well, ultimately, the shapes are only yeah. awareness, and ultimately, if you want to say that's it, right. ultimate, ultimate, you know, the whole universe is just awareness. Ultimately, ultimately <laughs> that's it. There's only one thing, one player. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, again, you know, and or, uh, paradoxically. And or. It's both. It's, it's both. both, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so there are, you know, you and I are the same person. We're different people. Both are true. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And One so, heart, but two separate bodies. Right. And all these beings and these teachers and so on, uh, they exist in, you know, great numbers, not only in, in physical human bodies, but on other dimensions. On other dimensions. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. On other dimensions. Huh. And they will appear into your life when that time has come. That's what has been my experience. So I didn't have to look for them. They just manifested either in the dream state, in inner planes, or, or in the physical. Yeah. That's probably another good safety point, which is don't go looking for these beings. You know, you don't want to go off into who knows what, looking for who knows what you'd find. But if, if they're needed, they'll show up or they'll do yes. their thing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so anyway, so you, you had this realization and it took a while to integrate and stabilize. And um, the memory thing, we've talked about that a little bit. Hey, you know, one thing we didn't mention in the memory thing is have you noticed that... Um, the memory, in a way, has become much more efficient. It's not like your mind is cluttered with all kinds of stuff that you really don't need to think about <laughs> or, or remember. Yes, yes. But when you uh, do need to, to remember some particular that, thing, there it is. That's true. Yeah. That's true. A lot of the stuff that I used to remember before is not necessary, right? Yeah. That doesn't come up. But if I need to remember something that is really important, you'll be there. Yeah. That's what I found. So, 
I guess there is that trust in that. So you probably don't go through your day with three or four songs in your head and thinking about what happened yesterday and what's going to happen tomorrow and blah, 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 while you're, in meanwhile, trying to do something that has no relationship to all that noise, the noise isn't there. No. The default position is awareness and rest, but the awareness in movement, the mind is still there. I haven't become a, sort of a spiced out individual that can't do anything. Yeah. No. So I this, can use that. This realization, this awakening that you're, is five, six, seven years ago, eight years ago? Yes, probably uh, about seven or eight years. I can't remember exactly. Okay. Something like that. And so, what is your normal experience now as you go through your day? Um, describe it. Well, I haven't become a perfect human being. Uh, nobody does. Um, in a relative sense, we all have imperfections, mm -hmm. blemishes. I guess that's the paradox that um, on one hand, we are that one being, uh, which is pure and perfect. Uh, on the other end, we have uh, a body mind which has got karmic patterns and uh, karmic conditions. And um, so, even the most enlightened uh, teachers in the world, they're still human beings. Mm -hmm. And um, so, my nothing has really changed. Um, I mean, uh, you would have to ask Leo because he's, he's lived with me. He's probably not as better than me. But it just feels that all that has happened is that I've lost some ideas about what was. Um, and, um, and before, um, I always try to uh, be perfect mm -hmm. and um, strive for perfection. And now it's okay. Mm -hmm. There is nothing wrong, you know. I guess that's the thing. We always think that there is something wrong. But what about if there is nothing wrong? Yeah. There well, then, in terms there's of never been a mistake since the beginning of the universe, right. right? What about if there is nothing wrong with the way we are? And what about if the divine just uses our uh, idiosyncrasies? Is that the word? Idiosyncrasies. Idi idiosyncrasies. <laughs> it, yes, that's it. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. And what about if, you know, my experience has been, he uses everything. Yeah. He uses everything to experience itself through that through that vehicle the way it is you know so I don't know I've answered your question ask uh, me more if partially you want. yeah so let's say you're going through your day you're cooking you're driving you're talking to Leo you're doing different things um, do you find that there's a sort of a, a continual multi-dimensionality to your experience where on, on the one hand you're active doing these things but on the other hand there's a sort of a a silence that um, just continu a continuum of silence, in, such that it almost so so that it feels like in a sense you're not doing anything, and mm. and also uh, perhaps even more so that in a sense that n nothing is happening in the external world because that silence permeates the external world as well. So on the one hand you are driving and cooking and talking to Leo, but the, on the other hand nothing is happening. It's, it's like this paradoxical simultaneous, um, yes. Does, yes. I, I don't mean no. to put words in your mouth, but does that describe no. your experience? Okay, it, when I'm by myself, for example, mm -hmm. maybe this is what you mean, when I'm by myself and I don't, I don't need to exteriorize myself, you know, I need to exteriorize myself to talk to you now. Exteriorize, yes. Mm -hmm. Exteriorized, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, then there is just this profound silence. stillness, yeah. profound silence. Um, then it feels like when I need to exteriorize, there is the appearance of a... Uh, someone uh -huh. that is talking to you now and so this movement between that and the appearance of the person still happens but now it's not believed anymore that it's actually a separate person living in this body right um so that's the difference and does the silence go away let's say the silence is all it's always there yes yes yeah. yeah yeah the silence is always is the base that contains everything right and then, you know, the, 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 the example of the ocean and the waves, you know, the ocean mm -hmm. is still there containing all, wave, all waves and all the time. Yeah. And um, 
So, but there's still the appearance. So, the appearance of the of the person um, still happens. Mm -hmm. But now it always did. But now I don't feel that somehow I have to uh, maintain some position in order to be a spiritual success. You know, I can just let it happen. You know, like it's okay. There's nothing wrong with the appearance of the person. It's right. useful. So would it be fair to say that now there's the appearance of the person and there's also this abiding silence and the two get along very well. Where now, yes. you know, 30 years ago, there was the person, but there wasn't the abiding silence. It was just the person yes. and that's, that was the yes. only reality. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, but they're both the same. It's like the sun and its rays, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's still all sun. Uh, it, it, it is realized that everything is ultimately the dark radiance of the absolute. Uh, everything. And when you see that, you know, uh, life becomes amazing, I guess. Yeah. Life, our life, our life as it is, you know, sometimes messy, sometimes out of control. Um, it's always miraculous. So would it be fair to define enlightenment or realization as the um, the you know realization the awareness of presence of being of the dark absolute as you put it of pure awareness uh, regardless of whatever else is or is not going on but that's that's the sort of the the key component is that 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 sort of vastness pure awareness whatever you want to call it that's there and if that's there come hell or high water, no matter what's going on, then you could define that as a realization or enlightenment. Yeah, there is always the sun. The sun is the primary source of mm -hmm. all light. Whether or not and there is clouds. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And the rise, uh, the rise of the sun and also the sun on a puddle of water, it's all sun, it's all one being, and yet appears as different things. Right, yeah. good. Um, I heard you quote Ramana Maharshi as saying, um, that which does not persist during deep sleep is not real. Is that the right quote? And please elaborate on that. Some, something, something. Well, Ramana Maharshi said, whatever doesn't exist in deep dreamless sleep right. is not real. Right. And, and actually, when I first read that uh, teaching, it was like, whoa. There's nothing in dreamless sleep. <laughs> right, so nothing could be real. <laughs> so everything is an illusion, right? Yeah. And uh, I guess the deep dreamless sleep, which we all go into every night, mm -hmm. all of us, uh, there is something in there. Um, what, so, what that something is, is uh, that, that pure awareness, unaware of itself. Mm. Um, so... So basically, it's like if we go back to the example of the sun, the sun needs an object. Um, you know, if the sun is in space and there is no object, there is no light. The light happens when it hits an object. Um, and that's when consciousness, consciousness happens, mm -hmm. you know, which is consciousness is a bit different than awareness. Uh, even though it's all one thing. Um, yeah. In your terminology. Be, yeah, the way you, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. Um, what was I saying and what was your question is gone. Well, the thing about Ramana Maharshi saying that, so is your experience yeah. of deep dreamless sleep different now than it was before your realization? Different. Yes. And I'll, yes. I'll, I'll elaborate on <laughs> the question if you was, like. But the, there was nothing. There was nothing in dreamless sleep before. And what is you there know, now? I, I had the same thing. It Still nothing? Uh, it's not a nothing. It's is a something is the potentiality of the absolute mm. is where awareness comes from mm -hmm. so are you saying it's, that now it's pure awareness unaware of itself because there is no object, no object. which you can reflect yes yeah so but well, it's not something that the mind can understand or even see because the mind isn't active in deep dreamless sleep right no the mind is asleep yeah. the senses are asleep Mm. But what I'm getting at here is that a um, number of people I've spoken with say that 
uh, after realization, sleep has become different because pure awareness is never lost. And uh, even though there's nothing to be aware of, pure awareness itself um, abides during the sleep state. Is that your experience? It's the, the substratum of everything. Yeah. So it's ongoing. It's not like, see, this is where I'm saying there is a difference between awareness and consciousness. Consciousness comes and goes. Consciousness, unconsciousness, sleep, you know, you wake up, death, the, you know, the, after you die, you know, consciousness. But awareness is the substratum that always is. Hmm. So if you are tuned in to this substratum, then there is no change. On the surface, there is change. Right. But on the bottom, there is no change. So there is no change between um, what we call our wake life or our dream life or deep dreamless sleep. It's mm. just uh, how many waves are there happening. That's the only difference. Yeah. Mm. The, sometimes this um, absolute state, or substratum as you put it, is the Sanskrit word is called turiya, which means fourth. And, Turi and yes. turiya. And so the, yeah, yeah. When the reason they, right, and the reason they call it fourth is that waking, dreaming, and sleeping are said to be one, two, three, the, the, the three states of consciousness. And then this fourth is said to uh, be a fourth, not only just sort of like one more state of consciousness, but one which actually has the capability of underlying the other three, of, of being yes. there perpetually as the other three cycle through their, their, their routine. Yes, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And in a way that gets us back to another question, which is that, uh, an earlier question, which is that if there's a fourth, could there be a fifth and sixth and so on? Uh, and, the, you know, um, some say that the fifth would be what I just alluded to, that, you know, the pure awareness is there all the time as, the, as waking, dreaming, and sleeping come and go. Initially, pure awareness could be there by itself, no, uh, you know, transcendence. That could be the fourth. But then having it all the time, regardless of whether you're awake or asleep or dreaming, that could be the fifth. And then we talked earlier, and that woman from Adelaide asked the question of, well, would you distinguish between self-realization and God-realization. Some people say that God-realization is a further development in which pure awareness is there as it always has been since it got stabilized, but that the senses have become refined and become very subtle in their appreciation so that the, the sort of the divine in the world begins to be apprehended directly. Yeah. That's not really well, a question, I'll... but it's something I hope you'll elaborate on. <laughs> um... Well, the difference between self-realization and God-realization, mm -hmm. I think, um, it's, it's mainly that when we experience a self-realization, there is still a little subtle, not duality, um, but it's still something resting in something. Mm. And so it's almost like I know myself to be this. Right. And... With God realization, you don't ex you don't experience anything else but that. Oh. You don't experience anything but God. And whether this keep going forever, whether there are subtle and subtler level, you know, every time you reach a level, um, you always think it's the end. But I know now that uh, there is always a plus step. So how far, how deep you can go? Who knows? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Personally, I think there's probably, well, infinite levels. Yeah, like, no end to it. Like, yeah, the um, the many, many, many infinite faces of God. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, uh, that's how I, I like to see it. You know, and so you go deep and you see something else, and you go deep and see something else. And if God is infinite, then that would be infinite as well. Yeah, because there's no end to the. I mean, if we think of, you, you've used the sun analogy a number of times, and the sun, the sun is just shining, uh, and, but it shines off different reflectors in different ways. Um, and, you know, shines off a muddy puddle one way, and a clear puddle another way, and a mirror another way, and so on. Um, so if we, if we think of, you know, our being, our, our body and, and makeup as a reflector, um, who's to say that couldn't that even this one reflector couldn't be refined to a much greater extent? And then even if there are limits to how much this reflector could be refined, 
there could be other reflectors, you know, other types of bodies, which yes. could, could, which from the outset are far more refined than a human body could even become. Yes, and ultimately it, it is all decided by that divine um, principle that creates it all, yeah. creates it all so that he can discover itself more yeah. through a different uh, configuration right and um, so it's like you know each one of us is really providing uh, a mirror I guess for the absolute to see it itself to us you yeah know? and a friend of yeah. mine likes to co refer to us as sense organs of the infinite you know or just yes sense organs. yeah well, uh, Nisargadatta said um, this body is the body the absolute because yeah. it was at that stage where you know all all that was left was it, the absolute. Yeah. 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 So it's, uh, what, about two in the morning now in Adelaide? Hmm, I didn't look for a while. Let me see. Yeah. Yeah. 156. Getting tired? Um, I could stay up all night now. <laughs> You're probably going to have to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just cover a couple more points and then I'll let you go and stay awake all night. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, one thing you met, you said earlier, we just passed by it, which I find interesting, is that you felt that perhaps this epidemic of awakening that seems to be taking place in the world is kind of like nature's response to the severity of the problems we face and, is, and hopefully holds the potential for enabling us to um, surmount these problems and shift into a uh, a better world. I mean, you didn't say all that. I'm elaborating on, the, I think, the seed idea that you brought out. But do you have any thoughts on that? I'm not sure. Ultimately, this is just an idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I have seen through our work, through t talking to different teachers, uh, this is happening worldwide. A lot of people, something that was quite rare, uh, people are popping up everywhere, uh, waking up. And... Um, so there is definitely a divine plan yeah. behind this. And um, so I'm, ultimately, I'm not sure exactly why, but this is what's, what's going on. And I think uh, we're moving into a, a, an era where um, maybe the... <sighs> what I said to somebody is the guru is dead. The era of the guru is dead, but but this I mean not that spiritual teachers would disappear, but maybe more the 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 the, the guru that is um, uh, some superhuman being with uh, super special qualities and perfection. Um, um, uh, that is is moving away, and what is coming is uh, the era of waking up together, you know, um, mm -hmm. so there might be still um, somebody, a, a teacher there, but more like a friend, not like a superhuman, um, perfect being. Um, yeah, uh, my guess is that there will always be extraordinary souls, you know, and but, yes. but even the extraordinary souls all set, have told us throughout history that, hey, you can be like me. I mean, Jesus, yes. Jesus said, "What's all these great things that I do? You know, you too shall be able to do these things, and even greater things." He, he said. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I think that's the thing. I mean, and and even in that tradition, you know, despite the fact that he'd said that, many would consider it blasphemous to suggest that one could become as enlightened a being as Jesus, you know, or something. Mm. You know. Yeah, and that uh, puts a little bit of a uh, ceiling on that. Yeah. If, if we're all the one being, why not? Yeah, why not? Um, and, but uh, I can see your point. Some people probably be very upset, but you yeah. suggested some other human being could achieve that status, that, that level of unfoldment, I guess. Right. Because there is this sort of attitude of, you know, we're all flawed and, uh, you know, we can never over, totally overcome our, our inherent flaws. And Jesus, you know, this, this divine being was perfect and we can never be like that. But I, th I think the point you're bringing out is that, you know, if you're a human being, then sure, there's always going to be some 
kinks, <laughs> some glitches, but, uh, but there are great heights to which a human being can rise. Um, and those kinks are the ones that, in a way, uh, are there because that one being wants to experience itself through those kinks. Yeah, yeah. A little salt That's makes the vegetable sweet. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. You know, I heard you say that when you first had your realization and started telling some friends, they got mad at you and, and thought, oh, who are you to say this? You know, how could it possibly yeah. happen? And you just, yeah. you look like the same as you always looked, you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> you're not floating two feet off the ground. Yeah, you know? well, your family and friends are the, are the worst. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, you know, which is all right. It keeps you humble. It keeps you humble. A prophet um, is not without honor except in his own home. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But actually, that was one of my motivations for starting this show. I, I, you know, have a lot of friends in town who have been, you know, meditating for years, and a lot of them were having awakenings and, you know, really genuine and profound ones. And they would tell friends, and friends would say, "Oh, are you kidding? You're you're just being egotistical. It couldn't happen to you, and you seem like the same old jerk that you always were, or whatever." Mm. And so they mm. they got so, all right. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. So that's the way people are going to react. So I thought, all right, I'm going to start an interview show, and I'm just going to start interviewing these people, and. Uh, show people that it's, these awakenings are happening to people just like them. And you know, maybe that will embolden them to believe that it could happen to them too. And you know, hold, hold, cause if you're totally close to the possibility, then maybe you're going to sh keep it shut down, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I must say, I love the way you, uh, do this show. You know, you, you, you bring so much openness and I know that probably you don't agree with everything that your guests to talk about, but it's like, you know, you got a really, um, open heart and, uh, and you give the person a lot of hope and openness, you know, and, and, and this is great because, you know, only awareness can do that. Mm. Well, thanks. And it's not that I don't agree with everything the guest says, although we might say that in certain ways, but it's more like, all right, this person and I have slightly different perspectives on this, and maybe we both are, you know, like just blind men feeling different parts of the elephant, and we don't have the, the picture of the entire elephant. And so let's, yeah. let's kind of rub these perspectives together and see if we can mm -hmm. both kind of expand each other's perspective. Yeah, and we can learn from each other yeah. because, uh, as I said, all these are, are the different expressions of God. And if you want to know more about the divine, then by sharing with each other, we can learn um, those faces we might not know yet. Yeah, excellent. So um, you say you haven't been teaching much yet, and um, no. but you're probably going to experience what I call the bat gap bump. Um, <laughs> where, you know, people will watch this and within a week, 5,000 people will have watched it and people will start getting in touch with you. And, and so what do you have to offer people who would like to get in touch with you? I'm open. Uh, I, I don't make any plans, uh, really. Mm -hmm. I haven't made any plans. This is my second interview. The mm -hmm. first one was with Jerry mm -hmm. and, um, sort of, a um, for me, it's like, I just flow with what life presents yeah. um, if there were people interested in um, these teachings I'm willing to do whatever uh, I need to do to get to them yeah and uh, so, so so physically you could travel to a place if the if, uh, well, if that were if there arranged. is enough teachers yeah right. if somebody can arrange it mm -hmm. I'm willing to yeah. go anywhere or you could do Skype consultations you would do that uh, yes I could do that okay yeah. and do you have any idea what you would charge for those <laughs> I've, I've actually set up a non-profit organization that because what I want to do is try to work out some sliding scale because I don't want to um, um, somehow um, uh, prevent people, people right. exclude people. So um, I haven't really uh, okay. noted down how it's going to work, but I was thinking of a, like a sliding scale where with a very minimal cost or mm -hmm. maybe even free mm -hmm. um, for some people and uh, going out for people that can afford it and um, uh, stuff like that so that everybody we're actually starting this um, um, this uh, this um, with this foundation we're starting uh, meditation for kids and um, for people that um, I have uh, handicapped and um, and um, and also offering maybe troubled teenagers this mm, is all nice. in the in what's going on and um 
and also to people that uh, can't really afford to go to very expensive um, retreats, yeah. uh, old, older people, um, yeah. And this is mainly something you'll be doing in Australia, or will you be somehow putting it on CDs or something? I don't know. I haven't yeah. thought of it. Okay. No, it'll, it'll yeah, that's a good idea, though. That's a good idea. Yeah. I'm like not you can sure. make a meditation just CD finalized. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We could do that. Or download. Really... Kind of yeah, thing. that's a good idea. Okay. Mm. Well, I'm sure there'll be all yeah. sorts of ideas. <laughs> mm. Good. All righty. So I think you know we'd like to interview a mix of people and some it's it's fun to interview really established teachers like Adya Shanti and people like that yeah. and who have a, a great deal of experience and wisdom and it's also really fun to find people who haven't done much teaching and even people who aren't who have no intention of teaching they just uh, you know ordinary person working at a job or something and they've had this spiritual awakening so it's you're somewhere in between because you you definitely you know, have stuck your toe in the waters of, of teaching people. Um, but it sounds yeah. like it's very much in the early stages and who knows what it might evolve into. Mm, yes, I don't know. Um, and when I first started thinking about teaching, uh, my first reaction was like, mm, I'm not sure, you know, and mainly because I see um, myself as still having, um, I guess, uh, a as work a, in progress. In a relative in a relative sense, you know, uh, I, I make mistakes and all this stuff, you know, but uh, then uh, somebody sent me a little uh, quote uh, that said uh, uh, that the life of a Zen master is one continuous mistake. Now, I'm not <laughs> saying I am a Zen master, but I guess that little quote sort of gives me the courage to uh, keep walking and, and uh, trying to do what is being asked of me. Yeah. So there, yeah. there was a humor group back in the '60s who called Firesign Theater, and one of their phrases was, "We're all bozos on this bus." That's right. <laughs> we are all a mess, and also we are that unconditional uh, love that holds everything. Yeah, and I can't think of a spiritual teacher who doesn't make mistakes, uh, and if they if they were to insist that they are beyond the possibility of making mistakes, I'd be a little bit suspicious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'd be a little yeah, there careful. There's no perfection. We, we, we like to, for our teachers to be perfect and we like ourselves to be perfect, but in reality, uh, we all have, uh, yeah, we are work in progress, like yeah, you said. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the, you know, that we're all friends kind of um, helping each other. The, mm. these days that's the culture that seems to be developing mm. that we're kind of all hol wonderful. holding it's hands really marching wonderful. forward together <laughs> yes it's wonderful yeah. yeah it's great okay so um i'll be making a page on batgap.com about you as i always do and people will read a little bit about you and be able to link to your you know there'll be a link to your website and anything else that you have um your book will have a link to the amazon page of your book um and uh, just to make more general concluding remarks, uh, you know, this interview has been one in an ongoing series. Um, go to batgap.com and you'll, there's a past interviews menu and there are about five different ways that the past interviews are categorized. Check that out. Uh, there's a place to sign up to be notified by email about once a week each time a new interview is posted. Uh, you can always unsubscribe. Um, there's an audio podcast, which we're still having problems with, but um, <laughs> I'll send out an email when that gets fixed. Uh, and there's the donate button, which, you know, obviously this takes a lot of time and um, it's still not my full-time uh, occupation. I have a day job a couple of hours a day. So um, any financial support, support people feel inclined to offer is appreciated. Um, so thanks for listening or watching. And thank you again, Enza. It's really been a delight. I really enjoyed this conversation. And um, we'll meet again. Me too. Yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for making it so joyful. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I hope you can sleep tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and now you need to take something to counteract the coffee. I don't know. Have a beer or something. <laughs> a beer. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. What is it? Cardamom. Cardamom. Irene says that cardamom, cardamom, cardamom yeah. counteracts caffeine. So make yourself some hot milk and stir some cardamom into it. And maybe, try maybe that. that'll yeah. help you sleep. I have some cardamom. I like to cook with different spices. Yeah. Good. Yeah.
Mm. All righty. So, okay. Thanks. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.